Hey everybody, I'm Dr. Dan McClellan, and you are listening to Gospel Tangents. The best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. I'm excited to have Dr. Dan McClellan on the show. He's kind of a TikTok star, YouTube star, and all-around star of the Old and New Testament. So we're going to break a lot of myths. We're going to talk about early Canaanite religion and how that was similar to Israelite religion. We'll even dive into some New Testament theology and talk about some, some other stories as well. So I think this is going to be a fascinating conversation. This is not your typical Sunday school lesson, that's for sure. So I'm excited to have Dan, the superstar, on this on Gospel Tangents. So if you want to miss this conversation, check it out. Welcome to Gospel Tangents. I am excited to have probably my favorite Old Testament scholar. <laughs> Well, it's not John Dominic Crisson, but close. Could you go ahead and tell us who you are? Uh, I'm Dr. Dan McClellan. I am a public scholar of the Bible and religion, and on social media I go by at McClellan, uh, spelled M-A-K-L-E-L-A-N. That's the phonetic spelling of my last name I used when I was in Uruguay. Okay. Uh, they don't like last names that begin with four consonants in a row down there. And, uh, <laughs> So I uh, received my PhD in theology and religion from the University of Exeter, where I wrote my doctoral dissertation on the conceptualization of deity in the Hebrew Bible through the methodological lenses of cognitive linguistics and the cognitive science of religion. So wow. I was basically trying to understand back then when they thought about deity, when they talked about deity, when they engaged deity, what was going on in their heads, and how is that reflected in the material remains, whether artifacts, ritual artifacts, or texts from the ancient world, including the Bible. Wow, that's awesome. So let's back up just a little bit. Okay. Uh, bachelor's and master's, where did you get those? So I got my bachelor's in ancient Near Eastern studies at uh, Brigham Young University in 2009, and then I went away to Oxford. Uh, for a master's degree in Jewish studies where I wrote uh, over there the master's uh, thesis they refer to as a dissertation. So okay. I wrote that on um, anti-anthropomorphism and the source text of the Septuagint translation of Exodus. So I talked about why there seem to be some passages that seem less anthropomorphic in the Greek than in the Hebrew. Oh, wow. um, and which was a lot of fun. I won an award for writing the best uh, dissertation for that year among my cohort wow. um, in that degree program. An award-winning author. Yeah, that's uh, that sounds great. Um, <laughs> then I went. Uh, I came back to the U.S. Moved up to uh, a little town in Washington called Bellingham, which is a lovely area. One that Washington I, State. Washington State. Yeah, to uh, go to. A school just on the other side of the border called Trinity Western University in Langley, B.C., just outside of Vancouver. And I did a master's degree there in biblical studies. And so two master's degrees. Two master's degrees, yeah. Wow. Um, some people think I'm really motivated. The reality is that I had lined up to go to a Ph.D. after Oxford, uh, and that school decided they were going to restructure their whole program the year I was supposed to come back. And so they said, find something else to do. So oh my. I had to go do another master's uh, program just so I could stay in the system. Uh, and then I was going to—I was accepted to go back to Oxford to do my, uh, what they call a DPhil, but my PhD back in Oxford. And uh, they didn't offer me any funding. Uh, this was 2012-ish, so we were kind of in the thick of, of the recession. So uh, a lot of programs were reducing the amount of funding they were offering. So... Uh, I had just gotten a job as a scripture translation supervisor for the church, was able to build this house. My wife said, if you want to do a PhD, you better find a way to do it from here, because she wasn't about to go back to living like a graduate student. And luckily, because I um, was friends with uh, the head of theology and religion at Exeter, Exeter University, Francesca Stavrikopoulou, she said, hey, you could come do a PhD with me. We have a remote PhD program, so you would just need to be able to pay for it, uh, and then, um, you know, I'm sure you've got a strong application, and uh, I was able to get accepted to the program and was able to secure funding, so I was able to do my PhD from right here, and actually defended my dissertation from right here because uh, the pandemic started, and oh. um, <laughs> I had to cancel my flight and trip out to Exeter to defend my dissertation three weeks before, and so ended up doing it in... Um, in slippers, uh, sitting in front of my computer. <laughs> so when you went to Oxford, you were actually in England, 
But for the PhDU, it was remote. Did it entirely remotely. Yeah, it was a, it was a wonderful opportunity, and I, I recommend it to folks who are, are trying to find uh, opportunities to do PhDs uh, in this field. There are a lot of programs in the UK that offer a remote option because in the UK, there's usually no coursework associated with a PhD program. You're dissertation prospectus is your application and so if you get accepted then you just write the dissertation and you can do that from anywhere so oh that's interesting I would um, at the time we said Skype uh, with my supervisor every few weeks when I had a chapter or, or um, something like that or they um, she wanted to talk about stuff uh, now we would say Zoom or something like yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> it's funny how Zoom overtook Skype because it yeah. used to be all the big thing. Big time, I, I imagine. <laughs> Whoever's in charge of Skype is <laughs> kicking themselves. They really dropped the ball. Yeah, that's yeah. funny. Huh. Well, very good. And you also, I think, off camera told me that you went to school with Trevin Hatch, who was one of my other favorite scholars. I did. Uh, we were uh, undergraduates around the same time. I don't know which one. I don't remember which one of us graduated first, but uh, but we were good friends uh, at BYU, and uh, we still talk regularly. And we are going to be uh, conducting tours in Israel at the same time in uh, in June. So, yeah, he's a good friend. I'm trying to go, so. <laughs> Do you want to give us a plug for your uh, Israel trip here? Really cool. Oh, yeah. Um, so Sacred Space Tours, uh, that's who Trevin is uh, affiliated with. Uh, they've got a number of uh, tours uh, scheduled for this coming year. And so from June 10th to 21st, I'll be guiding a tour in Israel with, uh, with their tour group. And uh, there are still a, a handful of spots open on the bus. And then Trevin has one scheduled for the same time. So we're probably hoping to... Um, to be uh, traveling around with each other. And then are you doing another one in October? Do I remember that right? No? Uh, nope, not doing anything, uh, any tour in October. We're going to do this one and then uh, see how that goes. And uh, I'd love to be able to make this a regular thing. So yeah. uh, we might do one a year, maybe two or three a year, depending on uh, how much we enjoy it and uh, how successful it is. Okay. And so you did work for the... Uh Scripture department? So, yeah, the department is Publishing Services Department, and I work for uh, Scripture Translation. Uh, it's gone by a handful of different names, the section within the department. Uh, but I left uh, after 10 years and one week. So um, I wanted to transition to doing uh, public scholarship and content creation full-time, and it just seemed like a wonderful opportunity. Uh, based on some discussions that uh, I was having with folks about uh, about how my uh, public scholarship, my social media activity was doing, I, I figured now was a good time to uh, to take that jump and go to full time uh, beard growing. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Well, so yeah, I I would love to to join you in the full time thing there. So hopefully that'll happen soon here. But uh, yeah, so this is exciting. So um, the reason why I wanted to talk to you, uh, you. Well, I would say you're a really good New Testament scholar as well as Old Testament. Um, and I, uh, can you tell us your, your, your calling that you just got released from? Uh, I was the Gospel Doctrine teacher in my ward uh, up until the first week of January okay. when I got released. And, uh, and now I'm actually uh, going to be the uh, Temple and Family History leader. So oh, that's what Out I of am. the frying pan into the fire. <laughs> <laughs> we'll compare uh, genealogy notes. So. Yeah. <laughs> I have a podcast on leading saints about uh, genealogy. So. Oh, very cool. I'll yeah. have to check it out. Yeah. I am I am uh, in the wilderness right now. Oh, really? This, so, yeah. Oh, you'll catch right on, I'm <laughs> sure. So anyway, um, Old Testament, I've actually taught uh, uh, Gospel Doctrine twice, and both times I taught Old Testament too. So that kind of feels like my wheelhouse, but I'm nowhere in any comparison to your scholarship. <laughs> And so one of the things that I would like to do uh, to start out here um, is to talk about kind of Canaanite religion. I think you have a book um, about, I think it's called, is it called Yahweh's Divine Images? Do you, want to, do you want to share us a little bit about that as we jump into that? Yeah, so this is a, uh, a revised version of my dissertation. So my dissertation was entitled uh, DD and Divine Agency in the Hebrew Bible, Cognitive Perspectives. And as I mentioned earlier, I look at the way deity was conceptualized, the way divine agency and divine images were conceptualized. And the book tries to take that work and, and it's pared down a little bit to try to make it a little more accessible. But basically, I'm trying to understand 
what they meant by deity and then how they engaged with deity through material media. So what kinds of things facilitated the divine presence and interacting with, communicating with the divine. And I develop a theoretical framework for the logic of divine images. So when people think about divine images, what are they thinking about? And this is a big question in a lot of research uh, into ancient Southwest Asia because we see people talking about the deity and the deity's image as both separate entities but also the same entity. You could refer to the statue as if it were the deity or as if it were the statue. And so I use the cognitive science of religion to come up with a way to explain what's going on with that. And it's actually pretty basic and has a lot to do with how we think about personhood and agency just naturally, how people t even today uh, think about uh, agency and, and what it means to be a person. And one parallel that I use to show, to help people try to understand what people were going through when they interacted with divine images is uh, I talk about headstones in a cemetery. If you've ever seen on TV or on, uh, in a movie or even yourself maybe ever uh, spoken with a headstone as if you're speaking to the person who is indexed or who is represented by the headstone, that's kind of the same intuitive logic that governs how people engaged with divine images. Uh, because this is, uh, a deceased person is, uh, in our intuitive conceptualization, is an agent we can't see. It's out there somewhere, but we usually need some kind of material media to kind of focus our attention to allow us to uh, think of the agent as present. And so a headstone is one example of that. And um, divine images are, are exploiting the exact same intuitive cognition. Um, and, uh, and so I, using that theoretical framework, I then go to the Hebrew Bible and say, how are they talking about the God of Israel? How are they engaging with the God of Israel? And identify a handful of things that seem to use the same logic of divine images. The Ark of the Covenant is frequently spoken of as if it is the deity themselves. Uh, where when it moves the deity moves when the deity moves it moves uh, we have the, the the ark narrative where the philistines see the ark of the covenant being brought onto the battlefield and they say god has come into their camp and they get scared but they end up winning the battle and capturing the ark of the covenant and then uh you have the famous story of um the uh, i forget who's uh whose wife it is uh, precisely, but uh, one of the wives gives birth to the son that she names Ichabod, which means uh, where is the glory or there is no glory because the glory of uh, the God of Israel has been captured. And then they put the, the Ark in the co of the Covenant in the Philistine temple alongside their divine image of Dagon. And then the next day they come uh, into the temple and Dagon's on the floor. And then the day after that, they come into the temple and Dagon's on the floor and hands and head have been cut off. So it's a battle of divine images and the God of Israel uh, wins. And so the Philistines have to send the, the ark back. Uh, they put it on a cart drawn by some cows and the cows take off and uh, march all the way to Beit Shemesh and then stop there. And that's where the... And you know, this story continues, but basically the Ark of the Covenant is a representation of the divine presence. Um, and then you also have other things that function in similar ways. The glory, kavod, of uh, the God of Israel is spoken of as kind of a separable a vehicle for divine agency and divine presence. Uh, the messenger of the Lord, the angel of the Lord, is another example of that. They identify in the first person as God. If you look in uh, Exodus 3, you have uh, verse 2. It says that the messenger of Adonai appeared to Moses in the flame of fire in the burning bush. And then Moses is speaking with this entity. And in verse 6, they say, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And so this is ostensibly the angel saying, I am God. So they are identifying as the deity, similar to the way people identify divine images as the deity themselves. And you've got other examples of that. In fact, the earliest, canonically, the earliest one is Hagar, an enslaved woman who is, uh, you know, out in the wilderness with uh, Ishmael. 
And then uh, the text says the messenger of Adonai finds her and speaks with her, but speaks in the first person as God. And then Hagar ends the episode by saying, it, the Hebrew is a little convoluted, so different translations say different things, but something like, have I really seen God and stayed alive, or something like that. Um, and then you have a similar thing with Abraham in Genesis 22, where he is uh, right after um, he's about to sacrifice Isaac, and then the angel shows up to stop him. But then the angel speaks as God themselves. And this is another instance where the angel is kind of um, taking on God's agency and authority and presence. Uh, and we see this in Judges 6 with Gideon. We see it in Judges 13 with Manoach and his wife. And all these are instances where the angel is identifying as God, doing what only God is supposed to be able to do. And uh, in Exodus 23, we have God saying to the Israelites, I'm going to send an angel before you to guard you on the way. Pay attention to him. Don't uh, talk back to him because he does not have to forgive your sins because my name is in him. And this, I argue in the book, is an example of later authors trying to accommodate this peculiar conflation of identities and explaining how it is that the angel of the Lord can identify as God and do what only God is supposed to do. And uh, this statement that he does not have to forgive your sins or he will not forgive your sins is exactly what is stated about God themselves in Joshua 24, 19. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your sins. And then the explanation is, my name is in him. And so the idea seems to be possession of the divine name, authorized possession of the divine name, um, endows the possessor with divine power, divine authority, divine presence, where they can identify as God. And I argue that this is this is a an elaboration and innovation on the logic of divine images, only instead of a divine image that can be identified as the deity itself, this is a sentient, talking, breathing, moving uh, being who's doing the exact same thing. Uh, and from there, I move on to talking about the divine name and ultimately how texts function in very similar ways. You have the divine name being inscribed on apotropaic um, texts and amulets and things like that as a means of um, invoking the divine presence to ward off evil. So uh, the Ketef Hinnom scrolls are one example where we have the priestly blessing that's written on a couple of silver scrolls and very tiny lettering, but the divine name occurs a handful of times across those. But th those were things that were rolled up tight and kept in a little pouch that probably somebody wore around their neck as a means of bearing the divine name with them and so having that divine power to keep evil away. And then they were buried with them, probably. Now, you said silver scrolls, like they were made out of silver, like gold, like silver? Yep. So, really, they were about uh, not even an inch wide. One of them's a little bigger than the other, uh, but they're only about a centimeter to two centimeters wide and just a few centimeters long, and they would have been rolled up. Uh, but yeah, someone etched um, old Hebrew letters into them, and it matches uh, very closely the priestly blessing that is in. Um, the book of Numbers. Um, but yeah, that's uh, one of our earliest examples of, uh, in fact, it is the single earliest witness to any biblical text. So these silver scrolls could be rolled and unrolled without damage? Um, they were probably uh, not something that was intended to be unrolled repeatedly and rolled back up, but they were, they were written out and they were probably rolled up and then stored. Um, now, archaeologists have unrolled them to be able to read them and so they're kind of cracked in places right. uh, but yeah that's uh, and they, what happens when they're 2,000 years old they crack <laughs> <laughs> and these uh, these are about 2600 years old so they probably date to right around 600 BC oh Lehi time can you imagine yeah <laughs> but um, but that's an example of, uh, of uh, authoritative text being written on on metal and then being kept for apotropaic purposes uh, basically to, to ward off evil and, uh, and protect the person who wore them. Could we think of them as kind of a, 
what would today say like a modern temple garment would it, kind of the protection that way the idea is very similar okay that uh if you have this with you it will protect you from evil and you know um whoever is out there trying to impose evil on you now they had a lot of different ideas in this time period about who it was who would be um causing problems for like you evil spirits more of yeah um things like that and but that is the single oldest witness to any biblical text that exists. Um, the next oldest you get is the Dead Sea Scrolls from um, 350 to um, 500 years later. So um, that's a pretty fascinating text. But this is an example of, uh, I argue in the book, the divine name being materialized, inscribed in, uh, in silver, was a way to basically endow this little piece of media with divine power. Uh, and later on, when we get the Torah, the text of the law, it's doing very similar things. The divine name is there in order to uh, invoke that divine power. And one of, the, one of the ways we see this kind of transition from more traditional cultic media, like standing stones. If you go um, to Israel, there's a, a place down in the southern desert called Arad, and there is, uh, we discovered a, a Judahite fortress there on the top of this hill, and there was a temple in the fortress, and there was a Holy of Holies, and there was a standing stone in the Holy of Holies and a couple of incense altars. And a lot of scholars think that the, the temple uh, probably facilitated the worship both of Adonai, the God of Israel, as well as Asherah. Uh, the God of Israel's consort. But the standing stone was a very traditional piece of material media, a divine image, an idol. Um, but you see in the stories of Moses and Joshua there, where they set up standing stones, but then they write the law on the stones. And then, like the Ten Commandments? The ten, like the Ten Commandments. Yeah, it's in, uh, one of them's in Deuteronomy, the other one's in Joshua. And then that enables them to worship God where they are. Um, and so this is kind of overlapping. It's taking traditional cultic media, the, the standing stone, overlaying the text of the law on top. And I argue in, in the book that this facilitates the transition of the function of uh, reifying, of manifesting the divine presence from the old cultic media to this new cultic media, the text of the law. And this is why you have, um, I also argue in the book, this gets elaborated on in a bunch of different ways, but uh, you have things like mezuzot. Are you familiar with the mezuzah? Have you heard of this oh, before? Kind of. Yeah, so this this is uh, little pieces of, of uh, text from the Torah are inscribed uh, and rolled up and kept in a little container that will be put on the, the doorpost. And this was, uh, you know, some people when they leave the house, they would touch it or they would kiss their fingers and, and, and touch it or something like that. And this is functioning very similar to a divine image uh, that we would see either at the entrance to a house or at the entrance to a city, where in some sense it is guarding, it is protecting. Uh, it is bringing the divine uh, presence and power into the house. Would we think of it as a cross in Protestant terms or Catholic terms? So that that's similar in that that's a piece of material media that we use because it has some kind of power that's able to ward off evil. But when people talk about the scriptures, whether the uh, Latter-day Saint scripture or, or the Bible, you'll frequently people or you'll frequently hear people say that. Uh, reading the scriptures is what brings God's presence. And that's a very similar idea. This is, this is taking that ancient concept of the text of the law as a species of divine image. And now we see the, uh, the Bible as doing the same thing. This is bringing God's power, bringing God's presence. Uh, you know, people holding up the Bible and, and call, casting out demons and things like that. It's, it's very similar. It's using that object as a way to call down God's power and manifest God's power. And so um, I finish the book by talking about how this has relevance to the conceptualization of Jesus as both God and not God, because I argue it's the same logic. But the main point I try to make there is that they didn't get rid of divine images. They just renegotiated what divine images were, whether um, what kinds are appropriate, what kinds are inappropriate. And so it became, instead of a statue made of gold, it became 
the text of the law written on tablets or on scrolls or on little silver scrolls or uh, put in a little uh, mezuzah on the door or maybe put into uh, the phylactery to wear on your head uh, or uh, today we would say in the Bible. So it's basically accounting for how divine images have evolved to become what's, uh, what they are today. And uh, that's, yeah, I'm <laughs> I gotta, I need to do a better elevator pitch because that's a long elevator ride to, <laughs> to, get, through, to get through my whole book. <laughs> well, since you mentioned Abraham, I want to start there. Yeah. Um, w one of my favorite scholars, or Leah, maybe he's not a scholar, but have you heard of Walter Zanger? The name sounds familiar. I don't know that I've read any. So he, <laughs> people probably get tired of my... 20-year-old uh, scholarship of the uh, mysteries of the Bible that used to be on the, the Biography Channel or a &E. uh, Walter Zanger, one of the things that he said concerning Abraham was Abraham was not a monotheist. Right. <laughs> <laughs> now, you just were like, right. I would expect that my, for those who are active Latter-day Saints, would be like, what are you talking about? Because, you know, Abraham is known as the father of monotheism, right? And in the, and I know you're a biblical scholar, but we've got the story in the Pearl of Great Price where Abraham destroys his father's idols. It seems to me that's really similar with a Muslim story. Would you agree with that? Well, there there are there is a pseudepigraphical text where Abraham does the same, uh, destroys, actually, if I recall correctly, it's been a while since I've read it, and uh, burns down the the place where all of his father's idols were being stored, and is kind of laughing along the way. I've kind of wondered if, if the, I mean, and I know there's the whole book of Abraham authenticity problems, but my, my, you know, I've always wondered if this might be related to a Muslim text somehow. I don't know. It's just kind of a brainstorming idea I have. Um, I don't know of any off the top of my head that would align with that, but it it's certainly a story that's been repeated enough in the history of, uh, of ancient Southwest Asia that it wouldn't surprise me in the least. I mean, because the story in the Pearl of Great Price makes this sound like... Abraham's father was a idol worshiper, and Abraham was a monotheist, and he broke his father's idols, and like, the God of Israel is all we need. But at the beginning of this, when we started talking, you said Abraham was not a monotheist. Tell us, <laughs> walk us through that. So these, these traditions uh, are coming from well after the time of any uh, historical Abraham. These are people who have certain ideologies about their own identity as, as worshipers of God and are looking back on their own past and negotiating with that past. Uh, in a lot of scholarship, uh, and particularly scholarship focused on what they call social memory, we talk about how we are engaging with our past to help understand our identity today, help make sense of the experiences that we're having, help make that identification useful and meaningful to us. And so when we look back on things that have happened in the past, they are more useful and more meaningful if they kind of resonate with us, if they make sense to us. George Washington chopping down the cherry tree. Yeah, well, th and there are a lot of ways that people will look at, uh, you know, the American Revolution and will filter it through either right-wing or maybe left-wing lenses and say, oh, George Washington was a libertarian. Oh, George Washington would have been a Democrat. Oh, George Washington would have been a Republican. He would have voted for Trump. Well, um, you know, there are a lot of different ways that people want that history to make their experiences today more meaningful. And the same thing happens with uh, the Bible and the same thing happened for the authors of the Bible. Because everybody writing in the Bible has, has inherited a past and is including that in what they're writing. And so they're negotiating with that past themselves. And so that's why uh, with, when talking about uh, these stories where the angel also identifies as God, you've got later generations scratching their head going, how are we going to make sense of this? How, how does this fit what we think today? Oh, well, uh, let's have uh, this angel be the authorized bearer of the divine name and that will make sense of everything and so they're constantly renegotiating their past and monotheism is a thing that um, doesn't really develop the concept as we know it today 
uh, was developed in the, during the Enlightenment in the 17th century. That's when the word monotheism was coined, and that's when it was kind of a, uh, elaborated on and described the way that we understand it today. But we like to retroject it back into the Bible. And you've had scholars who say, you know, Abraham was the father of monotheism. And then in the mid uh, 19th, no, excuse me, 20th century, the scholars saying, no, it wasn't until Moses. Moses was the father of monotheism. And then scholars at the end of the 20th century said, you don't get monotheism until Deutero Isaiah. Second Isaiah writing in the exile, that's when you get monotheism. And the threshold keeps moving back and back as scholars ha have to grapple with the data that indicate uh, there wasn't really a denial of the existence of other gods. There was a denial of the power and the significance of other gods because we were promoting the importance of our own god and so had to kind of denigrate all the other gods. But at no point do they um, assert this philosophical understanding of the universe as inhabited by one single soul deity. Uh, and, you know, the Hebrew Bible, even the New Testament, we have references to other gods. Paul in 1 Corinthians. Uh, talks about the so-called gods and lords, for there are many gods and lords. It says, but for us, there is one God, the Father. And that can be interpreted to mean, as far as we're concerned, only one God exists. Or it could just mean, as far as we're concerned, we only care about one God. So, uh, just like me going to high school in Boulder, Colorado, in 1997-1998. Uh, oh, that's why you're so liberal. <laughs> <laughs> I would have very easily and naturally said the Broncos are the only real football oh, team. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. And um, you know, I'm that's a Raiders a, fan. That was an e uh, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I won't tell you what I have a bumper sticker of Calvin doing. Um, uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on my old Jeep Wrangler, but um, also a Patriots fan. Okay. Okay. Well. I'm still upset about what they did to the Seahawks. Um, well, I'm upset about what the Seahawks did to the Seahawks by not not giving the ball to Lynch. Um, I agree. It anyway, was a crazy play. It was a crazy play. Um, but uh, anyway, you know, I could have said the Raiders aren't a real football team. The Broncos are. They haven't been for the last well, while. Yeah, and the Broncos haven't really been either. But that's that's neither here nor there. But the point is, that's just rhetoric. That's just me saying they don't matter. I don't even care about them. There's only one that matters to me. And this is what we find in the Bible. They're not saying, you know, we have this developed philosophical framework where we understand only one divine being to exist. They're saying, oh, the gods of the nations, man, they're, they're nothing. They don't matter. And um, you see that in, in Deuteronomy, Isaiah. You see it in the New Testament where they're denigrating them by dismissing their significance, or their utility or their importance or their power. Uh, and so in Second Isaiah, a lot of people will point to that and say that's where they're saying, you know, I am God and there is no other. But the same author also uh, represents Babylon um, and Moab and other cities, personifies them and has them saying, I am and there is no other. And so they're kind of rhetorically having these personified cities use the same rhetoric that the God of Israel is using. And it's not to say, oh, Babylon is the only city that exists, no other cities exist. It's to say, Babylon is the only city, city that matters. All the other cities are um, comparatively nothing and less than nothing. Uh, and so we, we have that kind of rhetoric in uh, the Bible that is aimed at denigrating the gods of the nations and holding up the God of Israel as the only real important deity. And, um, and Abraham is, uh, you know, you've got a, a part in Genesis, and I forget the exact chapter and verse, but uh, in the King James Version, it says, God caused me to wander. But if you look in the Hebrew, it says Elohim, but the verb is in the plural. The gods caused me to wander. Uh, and you have references to uh, later on when you have uh, uh, Jacob has absconded with his, his wives, and, um, and they've taken their father's uh, deities. I don't know if you remember this story. <laughs> so it was Laban. So it was Laban. Laban catches up with Jacob and uh, says, why'd you take off in the middle of the night? You've taken my daughters and you've taken my gods. 
now um, their um, Rachel is sitting on them. She's hiding them, and and she says, "Oh, you know, it's my time of the month. I I can't really get up," and so she's able to uh, to steal them. But then when they leave, they make a covenant, and Laban swears by uh, his God, and Jacob swears by his own God, and uh, and they acknowledge each other's gods. And they're and not the same God. They're not the same God. Now the the translation can kind of obscure that a little right, bit. Right, it's very obscure. Yeah, and it will say the, the swore by the God of Laban and, and Jacob when it's really Laban's God and then and then Jacob's God. So there are li little ways that the text is kind of obscuring these um, these instances. But yeah, monotheism is something that is a philosophical construct. And so it's not until you have... Uh, members of, of these religious groups who are adopting a lot of philosophical frameworks that they start to move into thinking about uh, the relationship of uh, our God to any other gods and coming up with this idea that there can only be one supreme God and then um, rejecting the deity of, of the other gods. It's, it's a very complex process. I'm actually going to be presenting, uh, organizing a conference that will take place at uh, Brown. Um, Brown University. Saul Olyon is a scholar who's written on on um, the lack of monotheism from the Hebrew Bible and particularly from Deutero Isaiah. But uh, some friends of mine and Saul and others are organizing a conference on uh, the lack of monotheism in the Bible uh, for next March, so March 2024. And I'll be I'll be sharing more details about that as. Uh, uh, as uh, things get organized. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Dan McCullen. In our next conversation, we're going to talk about many of the gods of Israel and Canaan. Were they associated with each other? Oh, well, you can look in the Ugaritic literature and you can find dozens and dozens of, of divine names. So uh, El, uh, Baal is another good one. Uh, Asherah, you have uh, Mot, who is the, the god of death. Uh, you had Yam, who was the, the god of uh, the river or the sea, uh, all kinds of different deities. And, and some of these are uh, national deities for other nations. Thanks for listening to Gospel Tangents. If you'd like to support me, please subscribe at gospeltangents.com or on patreon.com slash gospeltangents, or you can watch entire videos at youtube.com slash gospeltangents. I really can't do this without your support. I'd love to do it full time and I need a lot more people that are willing to, to help me out. So I'd really appreciate that. So thanks again for listening and don't forget to check out some of our other videos.